Hello and welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal chaps, one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate. Jeff, say something. Yes, that's me. Just to establish the difference between our, uh, our voices. And me, Benjamin D. Campos, uh, a designer and according to this, a believer. We choose a topic of interest, we spend a little time researching it, very little, have a discussion and then we publish the notes. And we do this um, to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be nibbling on in this oddcast is extraterrestrial extraterrestrial life. From the most corpulent blue whale down to the tiniest viral particle, everything that has ever lived has done so on our very own tectonically plated, watery shrouded, iron cored, four billion year old moat of dust. Or maybe not. Perhaps, despite the disappointing lack of findings from the SETI program, there is a single planet or moon orbiting one of the 200 billion or so stars in the galaxy, harboring what we would recognize as life. Are we alone? Would we ever detect alien life, given the distances involved? What are the odds? We certainly are not talking about Peter Stringfellow or planned obsolescence. So I think the starting point here is... What is life exactly? It's a tricky one, I think. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, if you bang life into Google, um, it will give you. It will say that life is the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter, including the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change preceding death. It's so profoundly. Oh, that's something else. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so that is life. And also, um, I think you need to explain this difference that you flagged, because, um, what was it? You said you're interested in extraterrestrial intelligence, not life per se. What do you mean exactly? Well, the topic of the podcast this week is extraterrestrial life. Of course, life doesn't necessarily have to be intelligent. So SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is just that. It's a search for intelligence, which may or may not be alive, but um, we're talking about, is there life out there that we would identify as life? So we think life is, or life has, certain recognizable features. You know, it's replication in some way, and uh, you know, through reproduction, growth and development, uh, death, uh, movement and motion, and usually some sort of uh, interaction with the environment and generally shaped by the environment in terms of evolution. So we can define life as we would recognize it. But the question is, is there any life out there? Is there any life anywhere other than here on Earth? Um, obviously, there's been no discoveries. Uh, as far as we know, we are it. There isn't life anywhere else out there in the universe. But it is important to understand what exactly it is we mean when we say life. And it hasn't been without controversy. Um, there have been scientists who have suggested that viral particles are alive and others that uh, debate that. Uh, perhaps they aren't. They're just little machines that are able to replicate themselves using the, the uh, mechanisms inside the bacterial cells uh, to clone themselves effectively. Uh, and also phenomena like fire, it has been argued, are actually alive because they tick all the boxes of the definition of life. Um, so a little bit controversial, but I think we all have a good idea of what we mean when we say life. And I think we have a fairly good idea of what it might look like out there in space as far as our reference points are concerned. So, you know, if we saw a humanoid alien come down in a spaceship, we'd probably know if it was alive or a robot, you know, again, purely based on our own reference points. But uh, in order to fully Paley's understand what watch. life is, yeah, and, and what could be out there, uh, we have to fully understand or at least get a much better understanding of what life is here on Earth. And uh, life here on Earth is uh, very diverse. Uh, we have, you know, our sort of scale organisms like um, 
ferrets and mules and elephants and pigs. And then we have very small life forms that we've only recently discovered like bacteria, which are smaller than we can see with our naked eye. And uh, most of the time, most of us have to take the uh, um, the advice and recommendations of uh, those in the know that uh, these organisms actually exist and uh, present a threat or not to us. And then there are even more um, recent, recently discovered organisms like the um, extremophiles, uh, you know, life forms that exist miles under the ocean near um, hydrothermal vents uh, or volcanically originating vents, uh, black smokers they're called, and lots of little shrimp-like creatures and crabs live around around these um, vents uh, with absolutely no sunlight whatsoever, feeding on bacteria. Uh, and then we have tardigrades. Tardigrades are like tiny little horrible, ugly, microscopic lice, it looks like. Uh, there are over a thousand species of these little bugs. They can get up to a millimeter in length, but uh, usually they're you know much smaller and you really can't see them with your eye. Um, but these things can survive almost anything. It's incredible. You know, you can freeze them completely, as you know, freeze them almost down to uh, um, absolute zero, and they'll survive. Uh, you can cook them, and they'll survive. Uh, and you can put them in a vacuum, and they'll survive. So you know, these things can withstand incredibly hostile environments so it makes you think well you know if they can withstand that on this planet perhaps these little bugs could uh, thrive on somewhere like mars which would uh, kill us instantaneously with almost 100 percent carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, so we have these extremophiles tardigrades normal scale life and uh, supersized life there are life forms on the planet that are just like um, communities of algae that are miles across and uh, root systems under forests that you could consider as a single entity lots of different types of life on the planet but we know that most life here is built based on cells you know you can cut them up and you get into individual little packets of processes and mechanisms that are super complicated and you can find uh, dna and rna and uh, lots of hereditary uh, mechanisms as well so we think we have a good handle on what is alive on this planet so is there anything even remotely like it you know, let's let's just ignore all the other possibilities of life that we wouldn't recognize, but just the life that we would recognize. Is it likely that there's anything out there? So, I mean, how big is space anyway? Well, uh, space is pretty damned huge. I can't even comprehend how big it is. Um, occasionally, I'll read or hear about something to do with the vastness of space, and I actually cannot think about it. Um, I find it so overwhelming the scale that it kind of just ties my head in knots and I need to um, go and you know watch TV or, or something to sort of uh, try to take my mind off of it and bring me down uh, so many people I mean Richard Dawkins for example uh, being one of them believe that just from the sake of probability there's bound to be life elsewhere in the universe um, and I think you've written here in the notes about how our own Milky Way is 100,000 to 120,000 light years across. Um, I mean, a single light year is is pretty difficult to uh, comprehend, or I find it difficult to comprehend. And let alone yeah, it's a it's a distance that takes light a year to traverse. Yes. So an insane, <laughs> considering light travels at 186,000 miles per second. Uh, if it's, if it takes light a year, then it's it's serious. Light from the sun takes eight minutes to get to the Earth. So, oh my God. So I mean, we're kind of here, you know, scrabbling around in the dark, and there's all these, you know, millions or billions or whatever light years of just out there. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's not a stretch to imagine that there just simply has to be some some other life uh, elsewhere in the universe, and also. I think if you kind of just think about how it's not miraculous that there's life in this on this planet, you know, if you take that out of the equation, then there's bound to be other life. I mean, why wouldn't there be? Perhaps. Um, if I could just um, continue on your um, the concepts of uh, scale and how we just simply cannot comprehend it. I just uh, had a look at some distances, some uh, astronomical distances here, and they are incredible. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen that short film called Powers of Ten, 
which just increases the field of view by a factor of 10 each time. And it just goes from a bacterium all the way out to the size of the universe. Uh, just by multiplying by 10, it was incredible. But looking at these distances here, it's sort of along those lines. We have uh, the Milky Way galaxy, which is our galaxy, which has billions of stars. Um, you know, the this, this, this sun is just one of an, an, an uncountable number of stars. You know, it's, they estimate the number of stars, the Milky Way. But anyway, our galaxy, uh, known as, I think erroneously known as the Milky Way, is indeed, you know, maybe 100 to 120,000 light years across, what could be up to 180,000, 200,000 light years across is pure estimates. But uh, the nearest galaxy to our galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. I mean, there, there are smaller sort of dwarf galaxies and the Magellanic cloud, which is sort of merged with our galaxy a little bit. But the nearest proper galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy, and it is 2.5 million light years from Earth. So it's really far away, and the, the distances between these galaxies, uh, the space rather, between the galaxies, there's not much at all in in that void. I mean, it's near vacuum. I mean, as close to a near vacuum as you can possibly get because you're between galaxies. But our nearest, our you know, our, our neighboring galaxy is two and a half million light years away, and that it, we we are two galaxies inside a group of galaxies uh, called the local group. Uh, which contains about 55 galaxies. And uh, our nearest group to our local group is uh, the M94 group, and it's 13 million light years away. And all of these local groups of galaxies are inside a supercluster called the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. And it is 110 million light years across. And it has at least 100 groups like ours, um, which is mind boggling. Uh, you know, and it's just one of many superclusters. Uh, and then it goes on and on and up and up and out and out. And uh, don't even get me started on the Great Attractor. It's just, or Grand Attractor, I forget. But uh, the scales are certainly absolutely vast. So when we think about whether or not there is life out there, it does depend upon the angle you're you're coming at. So, you know, there there are two schools of thought here. There's the the rare earth hypothesis that, you know, we're the only ones and uh, we're the only life in the universe, or at least we're the first, uh, to the, the mediocrity principle, whereby, you know, there's nothing special about us. You know, the sun doesn't revolve about us. We've proven that. Um, the galaxy doesn't revolve around us. We're just in a, a relative backwater in the galaxy. And uh, there doesn't appear to be anything special about us except for the fact that we're here. So the only special thing we know about our situation is us, which doesn't necessarily improve the odds of anything being out there. That's the thing. You may, you know, again, it depends on the angle you're coming at this from, but just because we're here doesn't mean there's anything else out there. And certainly there's no evidence to suggest that there is. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I follow that really. Um, just do the math. <laughs> there's just so much, I mean, there's just so much out there then for me it's just inconceivable that we are the only um that we as humans or no we life on this earth is unique i just simply can't imagine that it is mind-boggling but then we think of uh we think of endeavors like seti the search for extraterrestrial intelligence mm -hmm. which is a fairly loose group of groups uh looking outwards to try and fathom whether or not there are any intelligent signals flying about that we could possibly intercept and understand. Um, uh, I think the first recorded or, or first um, published um, uh, assay of the stars for intelligence was, uh, you know, way back in the 19th century. Um, but it's been a real, a, a real effort to try and intercept electromagnetic signals from the stars. I mean, first they looked at the stars and you look at stars, you, can, we, can, we, can you actually see intelligence in the stars? You know, perhaps there's some sort of super intelligence out there that has actually, ha you know, had the technology whereby they could actually move stars and, into patterns, you know, a nice hexagon of stars out there. I mean, you look at the constellations and, you know, it's hard to see the horse, it's hard to see the crab, 
you know you really have to stretch your imagination to actually see anything orion's belt i mean come on it's three stars uh so there's no obviously artificial constructions out there as far as we can see uh, and we can't see very many stars i mean you can only see a few thousand stars with your eyes uh, even though obviously there are billions out there but um so there's nothing that you can see that is clearly artificial or you know obviously uh, an artifact of intelligence so then you try and listen for the, the electromagnetic sounds and uh, vibrations and you know is somebody trying to send us a signal or trying to communicate with us in some way Assu assuming so, uh, aliens have radios exactly so or, or anything else that can broadcast you know energy uh so seti this uh community uh, has been going since uh, officially you know and, and funded from at least uh, the 60s and uh, they found nothing at all there's nothing at all i mean there, there's a, a couple of uh, interesting um, intercepted sounds that were a bit peculiar and couldn't be explained but no meaning has been drawn from them so so far nothing so you know the greatest minds uh, in astronomy has have always been very interested in trying to see whether or not there's something out there and there's just nothing nothing's nothing's forthcoming although we, we, we say that but of course um, ufos it doesn't mean anything that they haven't found anything i think last week i said to you about uh this thing that neil degrasse tyson said i don't know who said it originally he was quoting someone but he had this brilliant analogy where um taking something like seti and saying oh they haven't found anything is like getting a bucket and scooping up some water out of the ocean and then examining what you've just scooped up and saying well there's no fish in here therefore there's no fish in the ocean now uh, that and therefore is purely neil degrasse tyson's imagination run wild there the facts are seti haven't found anything that's the end of the statement we're not saying so there's nothing out there of course nobody of course nobody's saying that yeah I of know. course not i know but we know seti is very small budget okay. you know it's not a massive effort um, but it's a you know a concerted effort. But fact, they have found nothing. Hmm. One day they might. Who knows? But um, of course, aliens may actually be living with us now. We may already have um, uh, aliens uh, or you know in intelligences that are have not were not from the Earth. Uh, if you were to listen to the UFO community, uh, which is quite a large community. And I had a look at the uh, uh, the best findings of the most recent UFO sightings, and uh, it, it's interesting. You can see how people are interested. I was particularly interested in a sighting of an object in 2013 that was tracked uh, from a plane in Puerto Rico, and it clearly shows an object that appears to be moving in one direction, and it's going very fast. And they look at this object with a camera, they're filming it, they use thermal imaging, and I think they have radar data for it as well. So it is an object that appears to be moving, uh, I don't know how, what the altitude is, but it's in the air and it's moving very quickly. But one thing I noticed while I was watching it is it's being filmed from a plane, and the background is moving, which of course it would if you're moving. If you look at a stationary object and you walk around it, the background shifts because of your perspective so i think that could have played into the it looks like it's moving really quickly angle because i think that the point of view is moving very quickly so that'll accelerate any movement that's there and also the kind of way it looked to me even though it's a little dot or a really grainy video as it always is it looked like it was tumbling a little bit like it was a plastic bag or something so <laughs> i would and this is one of the best examples of an unexplained uh, object um flying uh, and I think it's, it's you know, is that all we've got? You know, everybody has a high-definition camera in their pocket, and uh, we're unable to capture anything even remotely convincing as something that's non-human. Uh, so I think I, I'd highly doubt UFOs are here with us, among us, knowingly, now. I don't know what you think. Oh, I don't think there are any credible sources uh, to suggest that there is anything. But also, again, it's this crazy scale thing. It's like, you know, our existence on this earth is just like less than a blip. Um, and it's, you know, how could this one little blip coincide with some kind of life colliding towards us that we notice? Um, but going back to the whole UFO thing and people's 
seeing this um where, where did you say it was is puerto rican puerto there. rico yeah. yeah it's there is this huge desire um to see ufo uh, to see alien in all these crazy sightings it's like the um the x-files little adage the i want to believe thing i mean even like last week or the week before or something like that there's a photograph that the mars rover took and there are all these people saying well that's clearly proof of um pan spermia uh when they there's a rock that kind of sort of almost looks like a face <laughs> or like a teddy bear or something crazy it's confirmation bias yeah it's, it, it always creeps it, in it's all it's all of that um yeah and so i don't know if i'm being closed-minded by saying okay well that's clearly just the shadow of a rock that doesn't mean anything or what so um yeah it doesn't surprise me that there are no confirmed sightings of anything at all no i think the best they have is a confirmed ufos in that it's you know it, it you don't know what it is mm. yeah <laughs> there's certainly no confirmed aliens uh, but there's definitely confirmed unidentified flying objects mm. Uh, the thing that really annoyed me about the X-Files was that um, Mulder was always right. He was always proved right. Yeah. And, and Scully never was. Yeah. And she was a scientist. And that always annoyed me because the reverse is true in, re in reality. I know it's fiction, but I mean, every episode, that was really annoying. Well, yeah, it got kind of tedious because Mulder was always right. And then Scully was always cynical despite... <laughs> Um, Mulder's like being proven a, wrong again and again this and again. amazing track record it's quite funny there is a um, there's a little there's an interview of uh, Richard Dawkins from 1997 I think when when the X-Files was in its heyday and he was promoting whatever book he had out in 1997 um, what was it what was his book from 97 anyway yeah and he was really kind of uh, grumpy and angry about the X-Files and how every single week there was some kind of um, supernatural or, 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 or something. Some, and, and he saw it as some crazy anti-science and it should it owed it to itself to be more accurate. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. absolutely. It was it's anti It was, was anti-science. <laughs> That's true, but it's just, uh, it's irksome. It's worth listening to just how grumpy um, Dawkins was. And it's like, if you watch an interview or listen to him these days, he's so much more cheerful. Um, but yeah, he is very sober, <laughs> um, you know, science researcher who's just not interested in any of this kind of thing. It's coming back, you know. What is? Uh, X-Files is coming back. Wasn't there a movie they've out already, that came out? They, they've already started filming, I think. Yeah, that movie came out decades ago. No, no, ago. no, it's a movie like recently-ish. No, I think they're, they're, they're bringing the series back. All right, not with... Um, yeah, with the original characters. No, Dekovany yes. and uh, what's her chance? Yes, yes, yes. Anderson. Yes. Yep, Gillian Anderson, that's the one. Be a little yeah, bit weird, they're all signed I up. think. Um, well, hopefully this time she'll be right most of the time. Um, I, yeah, anyway. Okay, well, let's, I'd probably watch an episode or two. I like The X-Files. Hmm. Uh, we'll see. Um, so we can also speak about, um, as we know, we, life on this planet, is the only life that we're absolutely sure exists. Again, we need to examine this. I mean, how did we come about this? So this this occupies a lot of uh, astronomical and cosmological scientists. How did we come about? Why are we here? Why are we here? And why is there nothing on Mars? Why is there nothing on any of the planets in the solar system? Most likely, well, that's, uh, but we are that, here, that's and easy. we're fairly advanced. Genesis. That's the answer to that. Genesis, yeah, indeed. Hmm. What is the genesis? Were we just created uh, just like that by some superior being? It's a possibility. Well, it's worth um, it's, it's worth bringing into this what Ken Ham thinks about all of this. I mean, he thinks we should stop um, this exploration of space. You know, it's there, there is no life elsewhere. Um, you know, it just says so in Genesis. Why bother? Yeah, why bother? Exactly that. It's a waste of time and money. Um, yeah, but it's a way of passing time. Uh, you know, it's an interesting way of passing time before you die. So, you know, investigation, exploration is fun. Yeah, but to, it's interesting. Yeah, but to know for a fact that there's no life in other planets, you know, so, suddenly... Well, it's like, it's like people who fish just because they like sitting next to the lake, uh, you know, enjoying the sunset. I suppose all the scientists and researchers and stuff could be just turning up to work just to chat and have fun with, While their, away with the their hours. colleagues, knowing full well that they won't find any life in other planets because it says so in Genesis. 
It's a possibility. Mm. But uh, the theories range from the panspermia theory. This is where the Earth was effectively seeded by some sort of intelligent race. From Mars. Um, from Mars is what the or, or, is. Or, or perhaps Earth was terraformed with an atmosphere and life in order to provide some other intelligence uh, a place to hide. Um, perhaps we were seeded or life was built on this planet by a von Neumann probe. A von Neumann probe or a von Neumann machine is a machine that's capable of replicating itself. So one way you might want to um, build your operational environment is to send out probes in every direction to terraform and pre-populate all the planets in the galaxy. Uh, giving it, making it easier for you to move around or your your descendants to move around. So panspermia, whether or not it was intelligently um, enacted or panspermia by means of comets, perhaps. So we had the, the recent Comet 67P with the little filet um, robot lander. Um, amazing, you know, a robot landed on a comet. And it came back that there are complex organics, apparently, although they didn't particularly specify what that means. Uh, by that, I, I guess we can surmise that the comet has a lot of carbon on it in some way, and they're complex in that they perhaps are hydrogenated. Um, but it's a dusty snowball. So, you know, it's a water ice ball covered in dust uh, with some carbon organics. So perhaps that's a snowball looking for somewhere to hit. So perhaps a snowball like that, like a comet, hits a tectonically active and volcanically active planet. And the heat of the planet and, uh, and the instability of the planet and the water and the carbon of the comet come together in the right place around a star. And uh, there you go, self-replicating molecules and then evolution. Yeah, it's quite interesting that because um, that's the kind of thing that like the creationists and the ID proponents and all those crazy guys... They kind of talk about um, what are the chances of that, and they go into the billions and billions and billions, you know, of of this comet with the right ingredients um, embedded into it, striking a planet which can accept these ingredients and somehow create life. But I think that's just such a pointless non-argument because it only needed to happen once. <laughs> and, yes, uh, and clearly something like that must have happened at least once because here we are and i think also go back to the vastness of space you know that the, the probability as far as i understand you know must be um greater and greater the larger we are surely well I, well I, we'll get on to probability theory just after i i mentioned the alh84001 meteorite this is a uh, the alh is alan hills this was a meteorite that fell in Antarctica in 1984. Nope, that's a lie. It was found in Antarctica in 1984. And uh, examined under an electron microscope, it seemed to have structures that resembled bacteria. So it looked like it could have been fossilized remains of bacterial particles on this meteorite. So it was very controversial at the time, and I think it's still fairly controversial, but these little sausage-like structures do indeed resemble, um, you know, the sort of uh, bean shapes of uh, the simpler bacterial cells. So who knows? Maybe, you know, this, this actually is an indication that there is bacterial life out there at the very least. So who knows? You know, it's still up in the air there. Uh, I don't think it has been conclusively proven not to have been um, fossilized life. So you never know. Yeah, so moving on to probability theory. Now, this has always bothered me because we know we're here and we know Earth has life. We do not know if there is any life out there at all. So calculating probabilities is problematic, I would have thought, because you have an event of one. You have one event to go on. You don't have a trend. You don't have, you know, there's no random data that you can collate into life-bearing events. It's, uh, it's very difficult. And I remember... Years ago, reading about this astronomer fellow, Frank Drake. Now, he was one of the first chaps to scan the heavens and to deliberately look for signals from intelligent life. So way back in 1959, he uh, got control of a 25-meter dish 
a radio telescope in Virginia uh, to search for intelligent signals to see if he can hear anything, you know, just whatever it is, binary or, you know, the, the prime number series or whatever an intelligent life form might want to broadcast to us. And uh, he didn't find anything. But uh, he wrote this crazy, crazy equation called Drake's Equation, where he tried to work out what the probability of life, intelligent life, in fact, is out there. And he, he just dumped in the most ad hoc and completely ridiculous um, parameters into his equation. And he came out with, wow, there's life everywhere. There's literally billions of civilizations out there just, you know, begging to get in touch with us. Um, and I think it's mostly based on, again, the scale of the universe. So, you know, these distances are incredibly vast and, you know, we're just one star of countless trillions. So it's it's very tempting to say there simply must be life out there. This is the whole the mediocrity theory. And um, it's just it's just that's not how probability works. We just cannot build a probability. I mean, and certainly it, the investigation goes along with I mean, there's the Kepler Space Telescope, which sees slight variations in the light coming from stars, and it's able to infer planets orbiting that star. So we're fairly certain there are planets around star, other stars. So the sun is not unique in having a planetary system. Perhaps most stars have a planetary system. So again, we look at us, we think, you know, why is there life on Earth and not the other planets? Well, because the Earth rotates at this speed and it's at this far away from the sun and it's this old and it has these chemicals, all of that sort of thing. So you can factor all of these things on whether or not there are planet-like, uh, Earth-like planets out there orbiting other stars. But I think this is very speculative because, of course, we cannot see, we don't have the technology to um, view another star apart from the sun as anything other than a dot. It's a, it's a point of light. We cannot resolve a disk of anything outside of our solar system. The distances are too vast. So a lot of guesswork is going on here. Uh, and I don't think it's proper probability. I think it's just, it's confirmation bias and it's guesswork. It seems unlikely that we're the only life in the universe, but then we could well be. Perhaps we're the first. Perhaps we are the first life in the universe. Maybe it may happen um, again somewhere else in the universe. You know, it just it's sort of evolves by itself. Or perhaps we, we create all the life in the universe and that we are the panspermioids and that in, you know, a million years hence, perhaps we'll have the technology where we send our own von Neumann machines out into the galaxy uh, to populate it. But we're the first. There's nothing else out there. And there's nothing to suggest that this isn't the case. There just isn't. A as seduced as you might be with the um, mediocrity principle, I think, you know what? We really could be it. Well, that's um, uh, absence of evidence. Uh isn't evidence of absence that kind of crazy thing just because we haven't found anything I that's true there's no reason to believe that um either way anyway i'm just looking well, up, i think i'm just looking up to the see, evidence is important yeah absolutely i'm just looking up to see who who is it that said um the that i can't uh, i can't even remember the quote but it's something along the lines of were we to discover life elsewhere in the universe it would either be gods or bacteria um can you remember who said that? There's a whole bunch of extra interesting bits of uh, stuff. It doesn't lead to my mind, but but certainly there there has been a lot of thought on if we were to discover life out there. I mean, the problems that you have in front of you are include um, timing. You know, we could discover life. We we could be a million years away from discovering life. You know, we we, we there could have been life out there but it went extinct a million years ago. And here we are uh, trying to contact that life, but forget about it because we've, we've missed them by a million years. Or, or you know, we're, we're a million years ahead of, uh, of something else. That's a, that is bacteria and there's no way we're gonna meet it. So the idea that we'll make contact with life out there that is even remotely close to where we are in the evolution and, and technological sophistication game seems remote because of the size of the spectrum. So it seems unlikely. 
you know, it, it, so that's the, the, the gods and bacteria argument. You know, if there is anything out there, it's either millions of years ahead of us or it's just bacteria. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> to, that's get, to get, to get the timing saying. right. Yeah. Forget about it. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and also there's just, and, and the scale, you know, the size of the universe, you'd have to have in, in order to send a coherent, intelligent message to another life form that is several stars away the amount of energy you would have to invest in that beam of electromagnetic radiation would be vast, more than we ever probably would invest. So we don't have enough energy to direct a beam, uh, you know, an intelligible signal or message at some other intelligence that's out there. You know, whatever you broadcast, it'll dissipate before it gets to anybody who's listening. Or perhaps everybody's listening and nobody's broadcasting. Perhaps everybody is no longer broadcasting with radio waves. We're all using fiber optic technologies. And, you know, we're, we're very conservative with our, our energy broadcasts and we're not wasteful by sending them into the heat sink of space. So perhaps there are other life forms out there, but everybody's listening and uh, nobody's actually sending the messages. It's a possibility. I wonder what would happen if, um, if we actually discovered that there were extraterrestrial life um, elsewhere in the universe. What, what would change? <laughs> uh, I think quite a lot would change. I mean, definitely, if we knew we weren't the only ones in the universe, I think that would have a profound effect on the way we... I, th I think it would, it would draw us closer, perhaps. I think really? that would probably be desirable. Because, of course, again, if you think about life out there, do, do you really want to let them know that you're here? perhaps the galaxy is quiet because it's full of super predators or life forms that have become so intelligent that they see everything as a threat and their prime motivation for moving around in the galaxy is to snuff out lesser life forms um, lest they become sophisticated life forms and a threat so if we if, you know if, if anybody takes any interest in us they want to come down here and kill us all uh, just so we don't grow up and uh, start throwing stones. No, you're that talking hurt. like a science fiction film. No, I, d I actually don't think anything would happen. I think people would still go about their lives and wouldn't think about the big picture. People generally don't. I've, because part of what I said earlier about how I can't get my head around it is because if I try and think about it, um, this the whole notion of just how... Uh, just incomprehensible. Well, we don't have the wiring to comprehend. Yeah, it. yeah, in, in incomprehensible. Just how insignificant my own life is, and then suddenly how everyone's life is when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. And I think were we to find um, evidence of life elsewhere, I think people just wouldn't even bother with understanding the significance of that, and would go about, you know, buying stuff from supermarkets, getting into a squabble with their neighbors. Um, watching EastEnders, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think I think that's possible. But again, it's never happened. So who knows what the response would be? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be absolute pandemonium. It depends what, what, what has been discovered. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we discovered some bacterial cells on uh, Europa, uh, maybe people would just, uh, you know, find that vaguely interesting, but otherwise it would not affect the way they think about the universe. Or if it, or if it's, or if it's a steam train of warships coming at us um, from, you know, uh, Tau Ceti, that would probably and, get us uh, united. It'll be, it'll be here pretty soon. I think uh, people will think differently. What's the other planet? I think it's one of the Saturn, uh, one of Saturn's moons that is very similar to Earth. Triton. Yeah, it might be Triton, where there's a whole load of um, research and. A lot of smart yeah, there people are some, trying there, to figure there out what's some, going on. Yeah, there, there's, it's water. Water and uh, water ice, I think, uh, turns on all of the uh, the scientists who are concerned with uh, working out whether or not there's any life in the solar system. So I think Europa and Titan even, and uh, anywhere where there's uh, liquid. Because it seems the idea is that with water uh, as a solvent, um it's more likely that complex molecules are going to get together and make things happen if they're floating around in water as a medium. But there are other mediums. I mean, you know, we're carbon-based life forms, uh, but uh, you could have silicon-based life forms. There are the methane uh, could be the solvent. Um, there are lots of uh, even even you know even with life as we would recognize it, there's quite a lot of possibilities um, that are substantially different from how we 
how we acknowledge life to uh, survive here on Earth. But of course, probably there's a lot of life out there that could occur uh, that we wouldn't even be able to recognize. Even if it were staring us in the face, we just simply wouldn't get it. For instance, we could be receiving messages from alien races now, uh, but we just simply cannot decipher what these messages are. They're an intelligence that we can't possibly comprehend. Or perhaps, again, it's another question of timing. Maybe these alien intelligences think so slowly that, you know, just to say hello, it would take a year. I think Carl Sagan thought of that one. Um, it could be, you know, <laughs> We, we operate on such on such a different time scale you know we're like mayflies whereas they're like uh, an elephant and uh, there's no way we can have a conversation or because a, the time a tortoise or a tortoise yeah no i wonder what would um i mean i i think just thinking about possibilities is quite an interesting um pastime here because i wonder what effect it would have on this planet's religious were we to discover life on other planets I think that would have, in many ways, a profound effect. Um, whether or not they'd acknowledge that uh, would be another matter. I don't. I don't. I don't think it'll have a profound effect at all. I think oh, God, uh, if yeah. religion is if religion is good at anything, it's good at completely ignoring these these massive um, shifts in thinking. You look at um, the Earth being the the center of the solar system. Uh, no, it isn't. Had no real effect. Uh, I, I I think religion is good at getting over that sort of thing. I mean, evolution. Uh, you know, we weren't created as we are now. We actually evolved from more primitive uh, forms that didn't have any effect on religion. Yes, it did. Kept on trucking. Of course it did. No, it didn't. It, it hasn't stopped it religion. Hasn't, it hasn't, hasn't reduced stopped. the amount of conscripts. Well, I disagree with that. I mean, it would have... They'll just get around it. They'll just argue around it. And they'll say, actually, we've agreed with that since the beginning. No, no. I, I think apart from... No, I mean, it's very well known about how these faiths, you know, membership is in sharp decline as we know more and more about stuff. Apart from Islam... Um, I, I dispute religion is in sharp decline or membership is in, in sharp really? decline. I dispute why? this. Yeah, I, I'd have to look at the, the, the but numbers. But why again. did you dispute it? I don't think that's true. I mean, how I think it's how just as strong as it, it ever has been. Yeah, but how could you possibly say that? We know so much more and more about so much more and more. I think you're right. But the fact is, is that, you know, a million children die in India every year from malnutrition, diarrhea, all preventable diseases and problems. The world is a big world and uh, it's growing at an alarming rate. And most of that growth is in third world countries. And these countries are hideously religious. You know, I think there are more and more religious people being born every day. You know, in a third world country, you'll have five or six children, perhaps. And they're, they're born into a highly religious um, family and they become very religious indeed. In the so-called enlightened West, who are having fewer children, I think it's a numbers game, and I think religions are benefiting from the uh, the turnover. Uh, two recent studies released almost simultaneously provide more hard evidence that religion is slowly losing its grip on humanity, even in the United States. And this is just the obviously the American Humanist Association; they have a dog in this fight. But it's not surprising to me that that is the case. And the point I was making is that I think were it to be a fact or it discovered that there is life on other planets, I think there would be a whole host of formerly religious people suddenly thinking, okay, well, suddenly the Bible is even more um, irrelevant. Profound and, uh, and applicable. No, I just I d disagree. I, 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 and they have a dog relevant. in the fight, and, and they'll argue, they'll, they'll, they'll spin it to their no, face. I'm reasonably confident numbers are down, so I just disagree with you there. I'm mm. sure the facts I'm are not, I'm not sure about that. Well, we'll have a discussion <laughs> about that. Um, so as far as uh, where is everyone is concerned, that was, of course, uh, from the physicist Enrico Fermi in 1950 when he had a he was just having a discussion in the canteen with his uh, colleagues. Uh, and uh, he basically said, you know, come on, man, why, why, why don't we see artificial star constructions when we look up at the sky? Why aren't we having visitors, uh, alien visitors? Why don't we find the debris of, um, uh, of spacefaring warships? Why aren't we receiving signals, uh, radio broadcasts from, from other stars? Uh, this is the Fermi paradox. You know, if the universe is as big and as old as it is, why then hasn't there been any, and given our level of, of uh, 
of technology, why have we not received or intercepted any signals from intelligent um, entities out there in space? Why? 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 Well, this and, goes back uh, to what really, we were really, it's, really, about. it's it, yeah, it's it's been it's been it's been just devising arguments and defenses for why we haven't successfully discovered anything of interest. I think that's so easy to get around that. Um, I mean, you just said a couple of minutes ago about how the, the timing, you know to do with just how, the, the vastness of time, um, how we are just a little blip along that continuum. Um, and it's one of our hundred million years could be half a nanosecond for some other It could, it could, could um, be. Entity. I mean, there are lots of reasons. I mean, a really interesting idea is the, uh, the planetarium hypothesis in that we are effectively quarantined. We're, we are in a, in a um, nursery. Uh, we haven't reached a, a high enough level of technology or sophistication or, or morality or whatever the the benchmark is, uh, and we're closed off. You know, effectively, we're we're our whole solar system is inside a sphere with little hole pinholes for stars, and uh, everybody everybody stays away from us because we're not ready yet. Uh, but when we are ready, perhaps that will be you know our little shell that we're inside uh, will evaporate and uh, the larger reality of the universe will be revealed and there's life absolutely everywhere uh, we're just still inside the egg as it were um which is a, a an interesting possibility you know we're we're in a zoo maybe because we're we're so young and pathetic uh, or another argument is that any sufficiently advanced intelligence just destroys itself it just destroys itself. You know, you get to a point maybe a thousand years from where we are now, or maybe sooner, you know, maybe in a couple of weeks, uh, we just wipe ourselves out. It's just nobody gets past a certain level of intelligence. Or the odds are against you developing intelligence. Maybe the only way you can develop intelligence is if you are on a planet that is susceptible to being struck by comets and, and, and is also volcanic. So that's how life propagates itself. But because of the risks involved, the odds are is that you'll be wiped out. The next meteorite that hits the Earth may wipe out all life on Earth. And then it'll be another few billion years before just the right type of comet hits us and life begins again. But we only ever get to a certain level before we we're nuked back to the Stone Age, as it were. Uh, so nobody ever really gets to become uh, interstellar uh, because they're just wiped out by whatever by, by, by whatever means, either by themselves uh, or by um, unfortunate cataclysmic environmental events. So, you know, that's a possibility. I, I personally like the super predator theory the best in that any any intelligence that does get really sophisticated out there hides the last thing it does is tell everybody where it is and what it really wants to do is wipe out lesser species because you know it's lives in fear that it'll be wiped out and uh i guess the ultimate goal is to see the heat death of the universe so you know everybody wants to survive and, and live uh so you don't really you really don't want to have something like the the arecibo message where it's a message that we broadcast out there telling us what we look like, where we are, what we're made out of, you know, come and get us. Look at all these resources we have. I'm not sure about that argument about how extraterrestrial life would be hostile for their own safety, because we're certainly not like that. I, I think on the whole, we'd be the type of um, life form that would, you know, welcome uh, strangers. Well, I mean... There are inherent risks, obviously. Yeah, there are, but you know, it's not to say that. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's a weird one. I think that's more science fiction. I think movies are obviously, or Hollywood, are more interested in in that idea. But in 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 reality, we'd be, hey, aliens, how are you doing? Oh, there was that um, Twilight Zone episode once. Yes, I know that one. Where you mean. You're an alien visits the wild west and um gives i think it was a, a brother a special weapon and he became the the most powerful gangster in the community effectively and then the alien gave his other 
brother, his brother, another weapon. And in the end, it's, it's brother, brother, at brother about to kill each other. And they stop for a moment and they ask the alien, you know, who are you? And why did you do this? And uh, the alien explained to them that, you know, if, if brother kills brother and like kills like and kin kills kin on this planet, then you are no threat to us. And, you know, he's like a sentinel. So, of course, there's the Arthur C. Clarke short story, The Sentinel, whereby there is an object that is just a, uh, a beacon watching the Earth. And uh, when the Earth reaches a certain level of sophistication, then, you know, the master race is informed. And, of course, this is 2001, A Space Odyssey, I think, which is possibly my favorite film ever, which was very, very loosely based on The Sentinel by Arthur C. Clarke. And uh, an object is, again, a beacon is buried on the moon, and uh, it's just dormant. But when the humans reach a level of sophistication whereby they can visit the moon and unearth it, or unmoon it, um, it sends a message to say, they're cooked, uh, come and get them. So uh, that, that that also chimes with my uh, favorite theory, the super predator theory. Another one I really like is that when life becomes intelligent to the point where it is able to communicate with other life forms in the galaxy, it doesn't because it also reaches a level of sophistication where it can leave the universe. It literally goes. It either goes into, forms its own its own universe, it, it buds off into its own universe and it just leaves. It, it no longer communicates with anything in the galaxy because either it physically leaves the galaxy or the universe, or it sort of beds down and, and is no longer interested to listen or to communicate or to be involved in local affairs. So perhaps it, it just sinks into its technology and lives in a virtual world that's much better than the real universe. Um, you know, and maybe we're living in that. Maybe we're living in a hologram. Maybe we're living in a computer simulation. Brains in a vat. Uh, and and we're, we're here because we want to be here because we have things like religion that propose a, a meaning when, you know, in a meaningless universe. You know, maybe we've, perhaps we've dumbed ourselves down. Maybe we were the gods that were ru ruling the whole universe, but uh, we've realized that there's really no point. And, you know, what the hell? Let's, let's dumb ourselves down and just live in these little bubbles and like a, like a videotape and it's cause and effect you know you can't get away from it there's no free will uh it's cause and effect all the way down so we're just playing out the movie uh, the best we can but moving on to movies uh the ones i, I was thinking about the films that uh, i was thinking about when i was thinking about extraterrestrial life 2001 a space odyssey which i've mentioned which i think is tied with uh, There Will Be Blood, my favorite film of all time. Awesome. Uh, we have Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, 1978, Steven Spielberg, uh, which again, uh, alien visitors to Earth, uh, which is very good. Independence Day, I guess this is the super predator theory. Uh, this is a 1996 film by uh, directed by Roland Emmerich, and it's about a sort of a viral extraterrestrial fleet of humongous ships that just steals the resources of planets kills all life sucks them dry and then just moves on mindlessly i mean it's like a von neumann machine so they're they're not really intelligent they're just uh that's what they do they're like locusts and then there's dark star it's a 1974 film by john carpenter and i thought this was interesting this film when i saw it because they discover extraterrestrial life. They, they, they're sort of a, uh, some astronauts who are on a mission to blow up planets and stars and things, and uh, it's just a day job. Uh, but they discovered extraterrestrial life, but it's a big inflated ball with feet, and it just hops around all the time. Totally not intelligent. It's like a big vegetable. It's a real disappointment. Uh, you know, if you want, if you meet the first contact scenario with uh, life outside of Earth, you think, you know, you romanticize as being, you know, a real momentous uh, moment and uh, is steeped in meaning. Uh, but this is just a big inflatable ball of feet. And it's just, it's a real letdown, which I thought was quite funny. What's your favorite alien movie? Uh, well, I'm a big fan of two, 
2001. Uh, I do like 2001, although I, I think last time I watched it, I noticed how long it is. But uh, the the whole alien idea is just so subtle in that film. I think lots of people watch it and don't really get that. They <laughs> just think it's just some weird disjointed movie. But I really like that. But Alien is a bit of a weird one. Uh, I was reading about the Alien franchise, and um, it's like the unusual um, sort of premise. It's the alien race aren't from some civilization. They are just creatures. A, a weapon. Yeah, well, I think that's part of what some people have kind of read into it. But if you take the films just as they are, then these aliens don't come from some kind of technological race and they're just um, extremely hostile. Uh, pretty much what we're talking about earlier, about they just want to kill, kill, kill and protect themselves. Well, they want to survive. The fact that they replicate, I think, is... And they, they change. They they want to survive. So it's about them. They're, they're incredibly hostile because that, that helps them survive. But what I'm saying is that they're not from some um, race, alien race that's created spaceships and laser guns and cars and potato chips and stuff like that they're 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 just this wild these wild animals or at least they are from the film but you you said there something about how they are filmed but i think that's some some other people have kind of read that into it or maybe ridley scott is post-rationalized subsequently yeah yeah i think i think possibly i think you're right Mm. uh but i like the idea that they are a weapon. I mean, if you want, if you really, really, really wanted to kill a lot, you would do it biologically. Mm. Uh, you know, a bomb is is a bomb is something you do now, and uh, you know it does a lot of damage, and that's it. We move on. Uh, but to really, really do a lot of damage, you would you would do it in some sort of biological means. Um, and I'm sure I read a story once whereby the best weapon was life itself life was the best way you can destroy things and use up resources and, and make sure that the universe is on course to a heat death uh, because it's so abusive and wasteful and uh, that's why it was designed originally right. I can't remember who maybe it was, could have been Greg Egan I don't know it's one of the science fiction novels I read a- anti-conservative propaganda movie possibly but um I think we've covered everything. If there's unless there's anything else you can think to cover. Nope. I think I think that's everything. Well, you have been listening to Eclecticist. Uh, we have a supporting web page, eclecticist.co.uk, which you can visit to see um, shows that are coming up, topics that are coming up. Uh, you can read details in our show notes from all of our previous shows as well as download the shows, of course. And if you have any feedback or any ideas, please pop them into the feedback form at the bottom of the page and uh, we'll be very happy to read that and perhaps uh, use your ideas uh, for a discussion that we have in the future. Again, the reason why we do this is because uh, we're not perfect and we don't know everything, so it's nice to do a little bit of reading around a subject and uh, educate ourselves as well as try and educate others. Our outro music of choice this week is, uh, again, something uh, open source and uh, out of copyright so we didn't get sued. This is the original wow signal it was recorded in 1977 by jerry eman and it's part of the seti uh, program he did this on the big ear radio telescope and it was pointed at sagittarius constellation and uh, it was a pretty weird signal that seemed as though especially at the time that it was coming from an intelligent source make of it what you will thank you very much and good evening